the take five is about image and leaders. And many people said that um, a leader with a strong image is going to give confidence to his people. That the people will trust him if or her again if they see uh, if they see their image frequently. That the people will have faith in the stability of the system, or possibly even other countries will want to trade or become allies with your country if they know that the person who's in charge can be trusted. Examples that you guys came up with, you said Louis the Fourteenth, absolutely, but he has styled himself as. Uh, the Sun King, just like Apollo the Sun God. Or Elizabeth I, who with the cult of Elizabeth and taking the place of the Virgin Mary and how she unites the people of England, both Catholic and Protestant. Napoleon and his image and the, the, um, the persona he created himself for himself still impacts people's opinion of him today. People think Napoleon's very short, and you know that he wasn't short. But it is images like this, where it looks like he's riding a Shetland pony, to be impressive, not to be an accurate reflection of his height. Because this is not an accurate picture at all. You would never ride a horse over the Alps. You could never get your cape to flutter so perfectly. Um, this is one, this is a, a poster that I've seen in a lot of college dorms, on a lot of t-shirts. And most people don't even know who he is. This is Che Guevara, who is a Marxist freedom fighter in Latin America. Um, but this image has become far more popular or well recognizable than what he intended to do. And even President Obama, whether you like him or dislike him, this is an important image. It really has come to symbolize the 2008 election. Uh, visually, it is stunning. It is very different than other campaign posters because he's using a street artist, Shepard Ferry. Um, but what it looks like, he's looking into the future and he says hope. And in 2008, when Obama was elected, he was standing for hope and change and progress. And again, whichever side of uh, the political spectrum you fall on, some people look at this and say, great, this is what we were inspired by. This is what we need to continue pursuing. Other people say, this is what he promised, and he hasn't fulfilled it, so he's a failure. But either way, the image is sometimes more powerful than reality. So we're going to talk. So once the First World War is over, um, and we have all these new countries, and we talked about self-determination, Czechoslovakia is one of these new countries. And their first president, Tomasz Masaryk, he once said that Europe was, following the war, a laboratory atop a vast graveyard. So laboratory is where experiments happen, and the graveyard is, is pretty self-explanatory. We've got the, the war itself, all of the death that war caused. Um, that has had a devastating effect on Europe, but it wasn't over. There's also the issue of the Spanish flu. During the war, all these countries who were involved had censorship, and Spain wasn't involved in the war, and so they were able to report about this crazy flu virus that started going around the world in 1918. It lasted for two years through 1920, and the Spanish flu, it's called that because that's who was reporting it first. Um, it's very similar to the swine flu that was here in America a few years ago. What is different about this flu from other types of flu virus? I mean, you think every October we hear, get your flu vaccine, get your flu shot. And often there are elderly people and very young children who are affected and sometimes die. This flu affected healthy young people, people in their teens and 20s and 30s. So. Europe has just survived this war, and then all of a sudden, young people who survived get sick and die. And the Spanish flu is like a normal flu. You'd feel really, really bad. You'd be in bed with chills and achy and sick. And then after a few days, you'd start to get better, and you'd have some hope, and you'd be ready to get up and out of bed. And about three, three days later, you'd get sick again, and you'd be dead within 12 hours. This had a devastating effect on the culture of Europe. And even Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, who was a veteran of the war, said, we are a lost generation. It's that those who survived either the war or the flu, it's like, what do they have to live for? If this is what mankind does to each other with war, or this is what happens, there is no hope. And so much of what we think of as the roaring 20s really is a way to mask the pain of this era. It's also why pacifism was so popular. We can't repeat these same mistakes. 
The laboratory aspect often comes in more of the political changes, especially in Europe with all of the changes to the map. Lots of countries will try different things. And in a sense, um, the world is trying, how do we try to avoid war once again? People had started to refer to the Great War as the war to end all wars. Gosh, we can never repeat this again. It will never be as bad as this. They had signed the Treaty of Versailles. They would signed the League of Nations. But there still is this fear. So in 1928, we have an additional attempt to avoid war. And the Kellogg-Briand Pact is just one more example of this, of this pinky promise, we won't go to war. But it's sort of like everyone understands, yeah, we're going to go to war again. That is, this is what human nature is. As if all of that weren't bad enough. Then we have the issue of Germany's economy. There is so much inflation, it's called hyperinflation, because of all the economic problems Germany is suffering due to the war itself, due to the reparation. So they start printing money and it has no value. So as a way to try and stop this vicious cycle, the United States, the United States gets involved, and this is the Dawes Plan of 1924. What happens is the United States government says it will loan cash to Germany. With that cash, Germany can start to pay its reparations to Britain and France, which is important because Britain and France also owe America money. They had borrowed money in the lead up to the war and the first few years of the war. And so the whole purpose while the Allies need money is to pay off their war debt. So you can see there, the US gives money to Germany, Germany pays their reparations to the Allies, and the Allies pay back the U.S. The money ends up back in, in you know, American pockets. So what is the purpose of this? It really has to do with the idea of blame, and Germany must pay their way, that they must apologize in this way. Even though the money ends up back in American pockets, it's important for the Allies to see that Germany is so, so sorry. And Germany is sorry, but they also have their own issues. They created a new government in 1919, because remember, Kaiser Wilhelm abdicates. So they established the Weimar Republic, and it's named after the place where uh, these documents were signed. Rather than an empire and a supreme leader, they go back to a republic, meaning representation and elections, listening to the voice of the people. So we've got the president and the chancellor and the Reichstag, which is the name of sort of the Congress or the representational body. It's also the name of the building. So just like in Washington, D.C., Congress can refer to the people or the building. So this is the Reichstag building in Berlin. And like any republic, there are opposing viewpoints. There are political parties, all trying to make sense of this new kind of Germany. And it's not always entirely simple. This is part of the experiment. One example we see of this is in Munich in 1923, there's this small little political party who gets in a fight, or a putsch it's called, in a beer hall, and they were trying to take over the election in Munich and win over their section of the city for their party. They end up losing, but it just sort of shows that not everyone is thrilled, that, every, that lots of people are looking for different solutions to the problems that Germany has. In the 1920s, Germany has this economic instability. Again, because they already have the war debt from fighting the war, and now they must pay the reparations, and they have lost much of their ability to make money. But with the Dawes Plan, things start to look up. Germany starts to feel like it has its identity back. And even in 1926, they are allowed to join the League of Nations. So this is a huge deal that this organization based on world peace and avoiding war is allowing Germany, who brought the whole world to war because they accepted blame, they now are, are allowed to be part of the world community. This is a big deal for Germany. They sort of feel like they're getting their groove back, and we see that partially with culture, with the emergence of unique German styles of art, like cabarets. Germany feels like, you know what? We signed that document, it's caused a lot of problems, but we are actually proud to be German. And then it all goes downhill. In 1929, the stock market in New York City crashes, and this causes a global depression. So in America, 
if the stock market tanks, if the economy tanks, that means America no longer has the cash to continue loaning Germany money. So there are no more payments. This is called a moratorium, cutting off, killing the payments to help the German economy. And so now the Germans must print more money. Inflation grows even more. And here you see a bill, a mark bill, for 500 million German marks. That wouldn't even buy you a loaf of bread. The inflation is so rampant, people will become so desperate. And depression is around the entire world in the late 20s and early 30s. But it is particularly awful in Germany because they were already struggling. So what will happen is the German people are desperate. And the political parties in the Reichstag are all looking for opportunities to sort of become the hero. And one party that will find a way to do that is the National Socialist Workers' Party, or the Nazis for short. This is how the Nazis will be able to take power. The Germans were so desperate, financially, psychologically, socially, looking for some sort of hope, and the Nazis will provide that. So with this laboratory on top of a vast graveyard, another one of the experiments is going to be with brand new countries. One of those countries is the modern day country of Turkey. And Turkey comes from what we have been talking about as the old man of Europe, the old sick man, that is the Ottoman Empire. The leader is going to be a man by the name of Mustafa Kemal. He was a military leader under the Ottoman Empire. He found success leading his men at the Battle of Gallipoli, fighting against the Greeks. And with these military successes, he becomes well known amongst the general population. We see this all the time where military leaders become political leaders. We saw it with Napoleon. Um, we'll see it with Eisenhower in American history. Um, so he is well known and the people look to him to sort of take the Ottoman Empire into a modern era. And he is known, he is characterized by this modernization. You can even see it here in this photograph that his style of dress changes. He wants to move away from the traditions of the Ottoman Empire and move into the 20th century and more like Western Europe. Some of his other modernizations uh, have to do a lot with education. He establishes schools. He wants everyone, even women, to attend. He thinks that um, the role of women in Turkish society is very important. He said, everything we see in the world is the creative work of women. Not only can women go to school, they can vote in elections, and they can be elected. Another way um, he is going to encourage this modernization, and in this case, modernization often is going to coincide with westernization for the Turks. Um, he wants, in these schools, he wants to change the Turkish language. If you see this picture, he's pointing at a chalkboard showing Latin letters. The Turkish language that had been spoken for hundreds and hundreds of years was using Arabic letters. And he wants to change that to a more Western or a more European system. Because when the Ottoman Empire was established, it was right after the Prophet Muhammad died. So the Ottoman Empire had been around for 1,500 years. And his policy is that we need to update in order to cooperate, in order to work with Western Europe. He is also going to secularize the government uh, because since the creation of the Ottoman Empire, for most part, for the most part, the political leader, the Sultan, was the same person who held the title as the religious leader, the Caliph or the Caliph. So he wants to separate those two. He doesn't want to abandon his Muslim identity and um, abandon uh, the Islamic faith for the people of Turkey. He says, that's, that's your private life. We need politicians who are concerned more with running the government effectively rather than following the dictates of the Quran. With all of this, he brings Turkey up to the 20th century. And he's known as the father of Turkey. And we even see today, look, women who can show their elbows. There's another thing that he wants to eliminate is that very covering dress for women. They don't have to, he doesn't think they should have to wear the hijab or a burqa. And even today he is celebrated and he is now known as Ataturk or the father of Turkey. The other country that is this experimentation is Czechoslovakia. It was taken from the um, Austrian Empire and there are lots of different 
ethnic groups. It's the same problem that Austria had. The two largest ethnic groups are the Czechs and the Slovaks, but there's lots of other groups. There are people who still consider themselves German, people consider themselves Austrians, there are Moravians, there are Bohemians, and even though they now have these borders drawn around them, they're having difficulty finding unification on just about anything else. And the first president of Czechoslovakia, Tomasz Masaryk, he asked the Czechoslovakians to say, okay, we know we have this diversity, we know we're not going to agree on a lot of things, we have to find some common ground. And he's able to do that by looking to their Protestant faith. Protestantism had started in Prague, in Czechoslovakia, in about the 1300s, so way before Martin Luther. And he's able to say, okay, we have to use this faith background, we have to use our Christian principles as the common ground that will bring us to the discussion table. And then from there, we can work towards other political discussions. Just a little bit of review with the Russian Revolution. It started in 1917 after Tsar Nicholas abdicates, then we've got the March Revolution, and then ultimately the uh, October-November Russian Revolution. We have the Bolsheviks taking over. It leads to years of civil war between the Reds, who are the Bolsheviks, the Marxists, who want this communist overthrow, and the Whites, who are um, representing the Duma, the nobility, those who want a traditional style of government. The Reds are supported by all of those Russians, as we've talked about so many times. Um, the Duma, the Whites, though, have more wealth, more resources, so this fight will continue. Eventually, the Bolsheviks, the Reds, win. And you know, one of the first major steps they can take in eliminating the past, eliminating the old empire structure, is just by renaming the country. So Russia now becomes the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or as we call it, the USSR. And just with the name, there's a lot of hints about the people and togetherness that would suggest um, uh, Marxism or communism. The leader of this USSR is, of course, Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the man who said we need bread, land, and peace in order to be successful. And he doesn't want to be a czar, he doesn't want to be a king, because that's where so many of these problems were from, where that style, that style of government. So he wants to create something new. So it is called the Politburo. The Politburo is essentially a cabinet, a group of men who will discuss and debate and decide on uh, issues together. So it is a, an, a group of people. Lenin is the most senior because he started the revolution in many ways. Um, and he is joined by his friend and co-revolutionary Leon Trotsky. Uh, there are a number of people, but the only three we care about for our purposes are Lenin, Trotsky, and this guy, Joseph Stalin. Now, Stalin was a bit younger than the other two. Um, not everyone trusted him, but he was popular with some of the people, so he is able to rise to this position of power. So it's Stalin that we are going to focus on. Now here's Stalin as a younger man, um, and under, under Stalin's regime, through his lifetime, the Soviet Union becomes known for a lot of secrecy, like secret police forces like the KGB. Even though Stalin wasn't necessarily liked among the other members of the Politburo, he sort of jostles his way, wrestles his way to get to power, and then once he's there, he changes the story of how he got there. Um, this is all possible because Vladimir Lenin dies, and for, for some reason, communists like to embalm and preserve the dead bodies of their leaders and display them. You can see a little bit of the, the reflection of the glass there, and if you're in Moscow, between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. on a Tuesday morning, you too can see Lenin's body. Once Lenin dies, Stalin creates this imagery that Lenin handpicked him, that Lenin chose Stalin to take over, sort of like Obi-Wan Kenobi whispering into Luke Skywalker's mind about using the Force, or Mufasa talking to Simba, and the imagery, the propaganda is trying to show that Stalin is the natural continuation of the revolution taking over from Lenin. That's one very easy way Stalin can take power, but another way is through these crazy policies. Um, he eliminates his rivals. 
He eliminates anyone who opposes him, even Leon Trotsky, who was there right at the heart of the revolution. Trotsky eventually leaves Russia because he fears for his life and is eventually assassinated. It's not just uh, Stalin's personal political rivals that he is harsh to, but also the, the Russian people. Uh, one thing he says is called the five-year plans. And for Russia's previous hundred years of their history, they keep failing, they continue to be embarrassed because they have not revolutionized. They are... So he comes up with these things called five-year plans. Um, Russia, for the past hundred years of their history, has had a number of difficulties relating to their lack of industry, their lack of modernization. So Stalin, one of his first goals is to build up the industry and use the resources. And he says, okay, by the end of five years, we need to have X, Y, and Z accomplished. So whatever we need to do to accomplish that, the ends justify the means. And this is sort of where that hammer symbol comes from, that industry is important. And the other element of the Soviet symbol is the sickle, and the sickle is for agriculture. Um, again, if you remember the Marxism and the Communist Manifesto is about violent overthrow by the proletariat to force control and create equality. So with agriculture, so much land had been owned by the nobility, by the royal family. And so the first step in Stalin's plan is collectivization, to bring together, to unite all of the farmland under one owner, the government, the people. Some people think this is a wonderful idea. Um, because they'll be able to cooperate with others, that the bounty of the harvest is spread out equally amongst all of the population. So people who don't like to work a whole lot, this is great for them. But there are quite a few people throughout Russia who are upset at the idea of the government owning their property. They say that, that they've owned their, their farm for many years, they don't want to hand it over to the government. This is particularly true in Ukraine, which was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. So when Ukrainians sort of start to protest, to, uh, to ask questions, why do we have to do this? We don't want to be a part of the collectivization process. Let, uh, Stalin says, okay, that's, that's fine. Um, I'm still going to take your produce. And he sends it to the rest of Russia and leaves Ukraine with nothing. To the point that between 1932 and 1933, about 7 million Ukrainians starved to death. So you can see why even in 2014, there are Ukrainians who are not entirely pleased about the prospect of rejoining Russia because they still remember this. So it is the confiscation of property, not just agricultural property, but all property. Whether you have a nice big house that your family worked really hard for and built by their own hands and saved up for, that personal property would lead right back to the problems that caused the revolution. So we need to make sure that everything is equal um, and there are also professions that are generally more of a threat to Stalin than others. Uh, if you think of scientists or teachers or philosophers, by nature they question and they ponder and they, they, they ask why is this happening or how is this happening. And Stalin sees that as a threat. Anyone who is threatening him is eliminated. So often what would happen is people would be arrested for things that they they hadn't committed any crimes, they had just, you know, made an offhand comment about the leader, about the government. They would be arrested or sometimes just disappear. And this happened throughout, throughout Russia. And so the people know he is very, very harsh, that he is stifling uh, individual opinion and dissent. Another way Stalin does this is through limiting religion. He does not entirely outlaw it. Um, that is, would be very difficult because of the orthodox tradition in Russia. But he tries to severely limit the church. Because again, it comes to who do you listen to first? Do you listen to what the priest is saying? Do you follow the teachings of God? Or are you going to follow the teachings and the rules of this new government of the people? So even though a lot of this seems really bad, the, the Russian people aren't entirely unhappy. And part of this has to do with the image Stalin builds of himself, his cult of personality. So there are people who benefit from the collectivization and from the equality. They prefer having a little bit of something rather than nothing at all. But they also start to view Stalin as this wonderful, kind leader. I mean, this is a great image where 
Stalin is holding a young child. Stalin likes children. And I have a family and I have children. Ergo, Stalin loves my family and loves me. And the image that Stalin builds for himself begins to overtake the reality. So there's the video clip that we watched in class. It is over. If you are in camp, it's over to the right. Take a look at that. There are questions to help you follow along. Okay, so you see in the video how extreme Stalin is in controlling every aspect of his image. And there are many people who say, well, how, how could the people fall for that? Um, very easily is the, is the answer. The people were desperate. If you think of all of those Russians who are the proletariat, the poor, the workers, the farmers, that the chance of stability offered by uh, totalitarianism can sometimes be very appealing. As much as we in America say democracy is great, it doesn't always work. And there is an element of instability where you're frequently having elections and there's changes in the government. So a dictatorship or a totalitarian regime can be very attractive. So in looking at Europe following the First World War, this idea that it is a laboratory on top of a graveyard, that maybe the experiment that has more potential for instability is not as not as attractive as stability. So then there's two options if you're looking for stability in, in a dictatorship. We have on the far left, communism. And on the far right, we have fascism. With communism, again, it is the violent overthrow inspired by Marx. The people become the government. So the government owns everything. They own the means of production. They own the industry. They own the agriculture. And there's that hammer and sickle symbol. With fascism, it comes from, um, inspired by the Romans, and the fascist is the bundle of sticks that you see there, this idea that, um, that rather than a violent overthrow, that what will make our country great is our similarities, our nationalism. Um, if you think of one twig, one stick, it's usually weak. It can't accomplish much. But if you bind together a bunch of sticks of the same si shape and size, they are strong. There is power in that. So with communism, that's what happens in Russia, in Soviet Russia. And fascism is what happened in Germany. Germany was looking for um, a boost. They were looking to someone who would make them proud to be German again. And again, that idea of nationalism, the sameness of the bundle of sticks. In communism, economically, uh, the government owns everything. They own the means of production. Under fascism, there still is capitalism, but the government controls what happens, both with the um, economy, with the press. So the, the very simple um, explanation of the difference between communism and fascism is that in communism, the government owns everything. In fascism, the government controls everything. They want to make sure that everyone fits into this national identity. Italy also will uh, develop a fascist government with Benito Mussolini. Another way to look at this is capitalism versus socialism. In capitalism, again, in America, we say we love capitalism, but it is not stable. There are ups and downs, and the market contracts and restricts and has boom times. Um, socialism, again, this idea of lessening the gap, shortening the gap between rich and poor, creating more equality, following World War I, that's really attractive. But the instability created by the war takes a lot of work. And so it is very easy to see why countries in Europe will be tempted by socialism or by communism, by fascism.